And I think the same thing is about to happen with Ayurveda. I think we're on the verge of really seeing a major switch. And that's because of a lot of people. A lot, a lot of people have contributed to that in the field of integrative medicine, functional medicine, Vijas coming to the United States, many, many great people who have educated us. And also it's because of the discovery of the microbiome. The microbiome, as we heard from Dr. Chowdhury, is this really kind of amazing discovery. It wasn't, you didn't hear about it 10 years ago. The reason was because you couldn't measure gut bacteria. They were very hard. They need an environment where there's no oxygen. Now with gene sequencing, we can study them. And we find this um, unbelievable world in our gut of all places. Strange concept. But these bacteria control everything. And they are pervasive. So we give this general definition to the microbiome you can see up there. And the question is, how many? Well, you know, people say, oh, 10 times more. Now there's a new number that says it's about the same number of cells in the body, but still 30 trillion. And uh, that's a lot of microorganisms. And you look at genes, it gets even more radical. What do we have? Maybe 22,000 genes? There are 8 million genes in these bacteria. And so that's huge. That's a lot of information. That's amazing. And where are they? Well, they're mostly actually in the lower gut. They're mostly in the large intestine, about 99% of them. And we now know that there may be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 different species of bacteria with untold numbers of other strands and so forth. So this is like a brand new world. Now, why are we so excited about bacteria? We always thought these were things you should avoid. But these are friendly bacteria, and it turns out that most of the bacteria in us are friendly. They do simple things like they help digest food, they protect against pathogens, they help the body absorb nutrients such as calcium and iron, produce vitamins, B vitamin, uh, vitamin K. Two, they train the immune system, and they help the gut wall develop and maintain its integrity. Well, why should that be important? The gut wall is everything. This is 30 feet, which has 80% of the immune system. It has a second nervous system in it. It's got a second endocrine system in it. This is where we get exposed to all kinds of problems. And, you know, well, what's the big deal? Why should we worry about this gut wall? Well, there's a lot of clear evidence nowadays with things like, um, celiac disease where we can understand better. We can understand, first of all, that things like, uh, this is a more general than celiac disease. Let me just divert to celiac disease for a moment. That's where you can actually understand where a particular diet will destroy a particular part of the gut wall. But now let's go, first of all, to some of the broader factors. Okay, the type of birth. If you have a cesarean birth, well, you know, think, well, how many people have a cesarean birth? That's not much. 30% in the United States, 50% in China, 80% in some hospitals in Brazil and Italy. It's huge. And you, if, if a child doesn't come through the birth canal but comes out in the operating room, totally different type of bacteria which culture the beginning of our, nerve, of our gut. And why is that important? Because it educates the immune system. These kids have a much higher percentage of allergies, asthma, all kinds of problems. So people are very concerned about that right now. Antibiotics. Well, of course, antibiotics have pretty much saved humanity from all kinds of problems, so you can't put them down too much. But on the other hand, they're excessively prescribed. Everybody agrees to that. And being excessively prescribed, we've just napalmed our gut. It's nothing about it. We're just collateral damage is everywhere. Okay, you get rid of the bad guys, but you're also getting rid of all the good guys. And how quickly do they grow back? Nobody knows. Some people, they grow back quickly. Some people, who knows? It might take a very long time. Lifestyle, whether you exercise, whether you smoke, all the different factors, diet being the number one, and of course, diet has a lot to do with geography. If you're in Africa, eating a lot of fiber, 
you're going to have a much more diverse microbiome. If you're in Europe just eating a certain kinds of foods, it's going to be much less diverse. And diversity turns out to be really good for longevity. Hygiene. We live in a world where we kill all the bacteria everywhere. People argue that, hey, you should live on a farm. I forgot which speaker said that, but you should live on a farm because you need to be exposed more, particularly at a young age. This super hygienic world is probably terrible for the education of our immune system. And finally, age turns out to be a big factor. Well, here's the father of Western medicine, Hippocrates, saying all disease begins in the gut. I mean, who ever took this seriously? He's the father of medicine, but what, how did anybody have any idea about this, Hippocrates? And yet this is what ancient medicines have been saying forever. This is the foundation of Ayurveda. All disease begins in the gut. Well, can we really say that? Yeah, we can. We can say that basically all these diseases, and these are just a few, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, moon disorders, neurological disorders, asthma, allergies, autoimmune diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, can all be traced back to problems in the gut. And again, when I was saying this notion of celiac disease, that kind of explains a lot of it. Celiac disease, we know very clearly what happens. You take gluten, certain people have a genetic susceptibility. Gluten has a compound gliadin in it. Gliadin goes to a receptor on these, these um, surface of the gut wall, and that receptor upregulates zonulin. I don't know where they get all the names, but zonulin breaks apart the tight junction between the cells. And there's where you get leaky gut. Oh, good. So now we have a model. Now we understand it. Now we believe it. We believe it to the point where we think that most autoimmune disease is probably caused by leaky gut. Now, the doctors hate leaky gut. It was always increased intestinal permeability. But it's changing. Now even they're talking about the word leaky gut. And so this is serious because if you get this tight, the cells are bound together by kind of proteins that hold it in a tight junction. And the zonulin opens it up for particular reasons. But when the zonulin opens it up, then you can get in uh, undigested food. You can get in um, lipopolysaccharides from bacteria. You can get all kinds of things in and it sets off the immune system. And you begin to get this whole chain reaction. And people now even attribute diabetes one to leaky gut. They attribute all kinds of diabetes, auto, um, autoimmune diseases. I mean, we know inflammation is the basis of a lot of major diseases to say, whether it's heart disease, whether it's any kind of brain disease such as Alzheimer's. We all focus on this notion of inflammation. Now, Dr. Chowdhury spoke very beautifully about this gut-brain axis, this connection. So it is like a second brain. And, you know, this notion that, oh, what I feel in my gut, I feel this feeling in my gut, how does that affect the brain? Well, now we realize it's one integrated system, nervous system, endocrine system, immune system, enteric nervous system, that's this separate nervous system in the gut, enteric endocrine system. We produce tons of hormones in the gut. I mean, it's amazing. And the gut bacteria. And the question is, well, what do you do about this? We happen to have somebody in the audience, Dr. Bredesen, Dale Bredesen, sitting right in front of me, who I admire very much for his latest book on how to end Alzheimer's. Um, and I just think what he's done is spectacular because He's taken all of these different components and putting them together in a very elaborate but very precise integrative medicine approach, which incorporates Ayurveda and all the principles of Ayurveda. And, you know, the book is entitled The End of Alzheimer's, and I think, wow, that's going to catch a few eyes. It's also going to catch a few doctors. What do you do now? when you have a family member who has Alzheimer's and you go into the doctor and you say, well, doctor, what do I do? There's no pill. It doesn't exist out there. Maybe some pill that might slow it down, but there's no pill. So the doctor says, well, you've got Alzheimer's. I don't know what you can do. That's it. So then you say, well, I happen to read this book from this researcher at UCLA 
And he says we can cure it through diet, lifestyle, and you know, there's 36 parts of this program, so it's not trivial. But what does a doctor do? His jaw drops. He wasn't trained in diet. He wasn't trained in yoga. He wasn't trained in meditation. He only knows to give you a pill. So now you're forcing that doctor to start to look. He's got to do something. You brought the book in. This is UCLA. This is research that's been published. You're pretty much the doctor's stuck with having to learn a new type of medicine. And I love that because I think... Anything that's market-driven has hope in the world. Anything that's driven by a customer who says, I'm not getting my value here, that brings us hope. So I think some of the components of the gut, which you can see, which are kind of basic but profound, rest and repair diet. Now, this is where it gets very diverse and very complicated. Somebody brought up in the audience, they were talking about high fat diet, a ketogenic type diet. And that's being used by a lot of people. Um, Dr. Brezen is doing it. Um, uh, Dr. McCola, a lot of people are using it for Alzheimer's, cancer, whatever. I'm not sure how that fits with Ayurveda. No explanation. You've got paleo people over here that are emphasizing one thing and then sort of paleo way far to one end that are super meat oriented. And then you've got vegans over here that are saying, no, it can't go this way. And, you know, there's sugar in the middle and these people want sugar and sugar is a poison over here. I, I don't know if anybody read the book of the case against sugar, but it's sort of shocking when you read what the sugar industry did in terms of lobbying through. But you know, is fat the bad guy? Is sugar the bad guy? It's really confusing. So I think this is an area where we need a lot of help from Ayurveda to figure this out. I was just talking to Dr. Chowdhury about it after the, I don't know if she's here right now, but I asked her, I said, look at how does this work? You know, Dr. Bredesen has the ketogenic diet, but doesn't sound very Ayurvedic to me. What do you do? I mean, it's kind of, it's interesting, but it's not obviously something that you'd see in the ancient scriptures. And she said, I don't think that's it. She said, I think it's the microbiome. The diet is changing the microbiome. And whatever it is, the microbiome is messed up. It's been confused, messed up, napalmed. It's been thrown in all kinds of ways. So you start taking gluten out of the diet. And for some people, that makes a huge difference. You start taking dairy out of the diet. For some people, that makes a huge difference. Ketogenic diet could be just what the microbiome needs to reboot, needs to change. It was an interesting explanation. I don't know if it's the right one, but diet is a huge, huge factor. And that needs to get resolved as what exactly, because we know from Ayurveda diet is so crucial, and we know that it's tailored to different individuals. And so there's a lot of knowledge that has to be understood here. Um, I like the idea of a diet where you give the system a rest, and then you start reintroducing things, and then you get to personally see what those foods are doing. That kind of elimination diet is a sort of foundational. Probiotics. I think the question I get asked most whenever I give a lecture is, what's the best probiotic? I mean, you know, it's impossible to figure that out. You can look at, a, you know, I, on my website, I have a chart that rates them and stuff like that and based on research. But most probiotics are pretty good these days. And the research is pretty good, too. For things like irritable bowel syndrome and for a lot of different conditions, probiotics are good. But different people have very different reactions to probiotics. And it's not only, you know, which is the best probiotic, but um, how do you take it? It's an interesting question. A lot of people will say, hey, you take it here orally, it's got to go down the digestive system. And where does it actually go? It goes down into your large intestine. So it's got to go to the stomach. It's got to go through the small intestine, very tough environments. So interestingly enough, there's some people that talk about probiotic enemas. Now, not something I think everybody's going to raise their hand and be excited to run out and do. And yet, when you look at Ayurveda, Basti is one of the most profound treatments Ayurveda has. Basti is a type of enema that uses oils, lots of herbs, and so forth. And ultimately, 
If you look at Chark, it says 50% of disease can be cured by Basti. So we're sitting on this treasure chest of knowledge in Ayurveda that's never been brought out to the world, that's never really been used. I mean, you can do panchakarma, you do get some Basti there, but this is not something you go into your doctor's office and talk about. So I think this is the key. I think the microbiome is going to shift and make us understand Ayurveda, make all the doctors understand it. I think it's the key to everything. I think words like ama, which we had no idea what it is, now we can talk about it. Ama, there's a model. Even celiac disease gives us this very clear idea of how undigested food gets into the system. So Dr. Chowdhury spoke about toxins. We can talk about undigested food, toxins, all these different things are, can be defined now. And the way the immune system reacts to AMA is probably a huge basis of all disease. We can talk about Agni much more clearly. Agni is a word, again, that you, know, you throw out there to your, you're riding in an elevator with a bunch of scientists, you say, well, how's your Agni? And they all look like you're nuts, you know? <laughs> but Agni you know, has a very profound word in Ayurveda. A lot of people would say that the key to health is having strong Agni. That's the whole thing. You burn Ama, have strong, and if you can rekindle your Agni. Now, fasting is an interesting thing, which is you know, not for certain types, like a pit of person. You don't want to run out and have them fast. They might come out and kill you after that. But <laughs> under controlled supervision, fasting in Ayurveda is very, very common and very powerful. Well, fasting is also a part of some of these key new programs that are out there in integrative medicine. So again, there's a recognition. Fasting, if it's got to be done right, you know, you go on panchakarma for two weeks and then you go out and eat pizzas, you might as well have done more damage than you can imagine because the agni goes down and then you've got to be very careful to rekindle in the right way. But it's a huge science of knowledge waiting to be understood by modern science. Okay, prakriti and vrikriti. Again, this individualization, when the doshas, each person has a different combination, wonderful. That helps us understand tons of ways of individualizing diet. And when those doshas get imbalanced, then we understand, oh, that's the key, get them back in balance again. So this could be understood scientifically in terms of the microbiome. The microbiome gets out of balance, boom, so many diseases come about. Get it back in balance. This one always got me, the seed of vata. I remember studying Ayurveda and they'd say, okay, well, vata controls the nervous system, vata controls movement, 80% of disease is vata, and where is vata located? Anybody know where vata is located? In the colon. Does that sound weird? Well, how can something in the colon control the brain? And yet, when you understand the microbiome, it makes perfect sense, because that's where the microbiome, large intestine and colon. So suddenly, a lot of things that absolutely made no sense to me now make, are very, very clear. So Another area which I think is amazing are, you know, all the herbs, turmeric, all the, you know, ashwagandha, brahmi, all these herbs are so valuable. They're being introduced as part of different treatment programs. And then again, if you look at these, the, this whole area, as I was saying, of uh, panchakarma and particularly basti, they use hundreds of herbs. And these Herbs, you know, we take them orally. That's one approach. In a basti, they're coming up another way. And what are they affecting probably most? The sesame oil, the herbs, what are they affecting? They're probably affecting the microbiome. That's where they're having a huge effect. So this, I don't even think we've explored yet. Everything we do is oral. We take turmeric, we take everything. It's oral or in food. But there's a whole wealth of knowledge we haven't even explored. And then we have these words, ojas and soma. Ojas was talked about previously, this kind of finest product of digestion. Nobody has a clue how to translate that scientifically. Soma is another word which um, 
is you know talked about in the Vedic literature all the time. You go back to Rig Veda, Sama Veda, all these different, always talking about soma. And the way it was described uh, to me by Maharishi was that ojas and soma are really the same. One is the, sort of the finest product of digestion and the finest product of the nervous system. And they're really important for the evolution of consciousness. So you really need to get your digestive system in order, as well as your nervous system free from stress, if you're going to produce ojas and, or soma and be able to have these higher experiences of consciousness. So there's kind of a biochemistry to the whole progression of higher states of consciousness. But they that's also related to the gut. So now you have a whole different understanding of why not only do you have to meditate, but you also have to do something for your microbiome. You have to do something for your gut. It's both that are very, very important. Uh, you could say, well, you know, a yogi can take anything. Just feed him po poison. You know, Shiva took this and his neck got blue or something. He just absorbed the, pos the poison. Great, but we're as Dr. Chowdhury pointed out, we're just inundated with toxins. We're already taking a lot of poison. It's a huge amount of poison. And so we actually have to take countermeasures. We really, really have to do things to rebalance our gut. So, of course, my research and all my effort for all these years has been on transcendental meditation. And as I said, Dr. Schneider did a beautiful job in presenting that. But that's, you know, stress. That is a key component. You can't leave this out. Yoga and meditation are probably the most valuable things for any integrative medicine person because people will not make changes in their life if they're stressed. They eat food as a comfort. They get obese, they get diabetic because they're stressed and that food, you know, the, okay, the food companies make it addictive, but until you get rid of the stress, until you get rid, until you kind of purify the mind till you purify the whole consciousness of the individual, it's hard to make any change. And for me, I really see transcendental meditation and meditation as an integral part of Ayurveda. Marshi had his own revival of Ayurveda. He called Marshi Ayurveda. But basically what he did is he just tried to put consciousness back into Ayurveda. It had been taken out of Ayurveda and everything was herbs and so forth. And Maharishi just said, no, as Dr. Schneider did in his lecture, this is really the foundation of Ayurveda. So yoga, meditation, transcendental meditation, these are the foundations, really, of Ayurveda. Maharishi had, he was a very visionary man, and he had this notion of having a hospital of sorts which would combine everything, whether it's traditional Chinese medicine, whether it was Ayurveda, I asked him, I said, well, why aren't we looking at all these other types of programs? We've only been looking at Ayurveda to, to now. And he said, he said, no, anything that works is Ayurveda. So I like that. That was a good definition for me. <laughs> and it, here's a beautiful quote from him. When the total intelligence of natural law of Veda is lively in the individual physiology, there's perfect synchrony between the functioning of every individual cell and the holistic functioning of the body as a whole and between individual intelligence and cosmic intelligence. In the state of complete integration, all thought and action are spontaneously in harmony with natural law, and the individual enjoys perfect health. So thank you very much. I just... <laughs> threw up my, my book, latest book there, and also a website, which has a lot more information on this. Thank you.